Battalion of President Heading, maintain 3,500 till established on the localizer. Third, the ILS 32 approach. Before you joined, I told him that um, although you're a an official, a, a real air traffic controller, that these are not official FAA opinions. So these are your personal opinions. Yes, but we do. You. Yeah, we do appreciate you being here. Um, you know, the whole week we're talking this week is about professionalism, and I guess a good place to start, a good segue is, you know, today was my second flight back to flying. And the first flight back, I was trying to wear one of those N95 masks, which is really, really, you know, it seals up your whole mouth. And um, ATC just couldn't hear me. And right. it happened, it happened to also be a guy, I don't, um, I don't know how to describe him. He just seemed a little combative from the start. I don't know if he was having a bad day or what was going on. But it was, it was, you know, at Palm Springs and the tower and, you know, even just asking for a request to come back to the airport was kind of, he's kind of like, well, what do you want? You know, what do you want to do? Wait a minute. I don't understand. Okay, so no, no, say that again for me. What do you want to do? He's like feeling very like something's not going right in his day. And then as my transmissions get worse and worse and worse, at some point he just says, you know what? I, you need to talk into the mic and I can't understand a word you're saying. And we have this sort of, it starts to become a kind of combative conversation so maybe that's a good place to start and i guess my question for you is when i look around at pilots i know the ones that act professionally and i know the ones that don't what does professionalism mean to you in that way as an air traffic controller like you know sometimes you have to be stern with pilots but is there ever room for like scolding a pilot or, or how does that work you know if, as a professional air traffic controller so so we have to bite our tongue sometimes and, and pause you know there's obviously areas where we can improve on and sometimes our reactions are a little bit quick and hasty, but you know, it all starts with that initial call. If he couldn't hear you from the beginning, you've already started off on the wrong foot and you don't know it. You've already created, you know, a barrier with your communication. So, you know, we have to, we have to do our job professionally all the time. We're always reported and we want the pilots to sound like, even if you're not a professional, you don't fly for, for hire or an airline or some sort of charter. If you sound like you know what you're doing, it goes a long way. And that starts with something as simple as the volume. So from minute one with that controller, it seems like you guys were already not getting along, which is not a good way to start a, a conversation, you know? So right. you know, I, I, first step would be, you know, mimic the pros the best you can. Sound confident sound like you know what you want to do and deliver your message confidently and it'll go a long way with the controllers. Yeah. Yeah. I felt like it kind of like makes your job a lot harder just straight away. Right. If, if you can't understand what we're saying or don't know the phraseology we're using. Right. And, and that's one of my, you know, tips for the GA pilots. You're not immersed in the system all the time. You're not hearing the really most of our instructions are pretty mundane and routine. It's something we, we say a million times a day. Whereas, the, you know, let's just assume somebody flies an hour a week. That's 50 hours a year. And that's probably a lot for a lot of pilots. That's not enough time to really be in tune with every little thing that gets said. We say it all the time. So we kind of have this expectation and it's not correct. We shouldn't expect everyone to know everything we're about to do. But there's tools that those pilots can take on the side. You could listen to probably your facility on live ATC. You can hear it. You can immerse yourself even if you're not in the airplane, the more you're exposed to those type of, you know, communications and hearing it, the better you're going to be when it's your turn to key up the mic and talk. I, when I had students, I used to say, we think, and then we push the button. We don't right. push the button and then start thinking about what we're going to say. So. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. <clears throat> and um, it felt to me actually that this, like, it, like I might not have been the catalyst. I think this guy was upset about something else, like something, some right. other thing, like something was, it just wasn't a great day. Um, what are those days where you go home and you think that was really great? Like I did really well today, you know, like, do you have, do you have an, a, like a, any sort of self-assessment when you feel like as a controller, things went perfectly smoothly and I was like the man versus man, I don't want to repeat today. I hope tomorrow's better than that. Yeah, uh, I don't know that I've ever walked away from any session saying it's perfect. I mean, we're, we're critical <laughs> of ourselves. And there's yeah. always something that we can improve on, which is good. You come back the next day and, and, yeah. and try to do it better. But the days where you feel the best are, you know, maybe you didn't, for me personally, I didn't uh, react emotionally on frequency. I didn't let the, you know, the busy periods 
make it sound like I was busy. I stayed on top of it. I, you know, stayed even keeled the entire time and, and got everybody where they wanted to be. You know, it, all the stories end the same. They, they either leave your airspace or they're coming into your airspace to land. How we interact in the in the in between, and, and getting you in those positions is important. And I judge myself. What we all do. We can. It, we all go leave. We leave the job behind. I mean, we're not really bringing a briefcase with us home. So, um, mm-hmm. which is great. Um, but the days we feel the best is we know we did our our best to get airplanes efficiently where they wanted to go. And mm-hmm. you know, for me, I kept my cool and didn't let some of my past experiences kind of put me into a really like looking down on somebody who's not doing it perfect right yeah that's interesting the C- cfis by the way have a very similar struggle <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yeah yeah so at oakland so like let me just think you know when i was there, when you were talking right there there was a time at san carlos where a controller really lost lost it on me like um i, mean, I can't remember what the circumstances were but his explosion his emotional explosion on the frequency was enough for all of us to just stay silent i think i landed after that it was just like mm-hmm. wow that was not his best moment and i think he's since retired um so this stuff happens right like there's there's right. you're i mean I, sometimes i really try to get my head into the experience of being a controller and you're up there and you've got a mic right you can't actually move the plane you can't put it where you want to put it and just slide mm-hmm. it there right so you're you're sort of relying on everybody to listen to everything and pay attention and sort of follow yeah. instructions and there's so much room for error and so much room for frustration. At Oakland, when I was a much younger instructor, it was pretty common for the tower to say to me, you know what, just call me when you land. And then I would call them and they would sometimes straight up yell at me, but at least this time it's on a phone, Mm -hmm. right? And they would say, you cannot do that thing you guys are doing out there. Do you understand? And here's why. And we would have like a back and forth. Do you have any, anything like that? Like, you know, do you ever do that? Do you ever tell a pilot, just call me when you land, let's discuss this or? Does that kind of uh, I actually got a chance to sort of apologize to a, a, a survey <laughs> pilot recently. Um, <laughs> the survey is done pretty much on on the final to our main runway, and most of the time, you know, they're always VFR when they come in. They yeah. they know how to stay off of the final, and the, but from a controller perspective, it looks like they're on the final, and they're very low. But there's airplanes that are you know arriving at the airport very close. And long story short, I was busy, and that airplane was underneath the final approach fix, only a couple hundred feet off the ground. But it was a distraction for me from the get-go, and I didn't realize it at first. They were the one trying to get into the Charlie, and all they do is kind of parallel final, overfly the airport, and they kind of depart off to the south. Um, the interaction was I, – I should have bit my tongue and waited and I probably should have said, Hey, call me when you land, we need to talk about this. And we got to do that later on. A few weeks later, I talked to him again and said, Hey, um, I apologize. I was upset on the frequency. And it was really because he was directly underneath the rivals. And I, I felt like he didn't understand where he fit into that picture. He was a yeah. conflict with everybody that I was talking to. And that was the reason I told the person that was calling and I didn't know it was him at first to stay out of the Charlie. Um, but yeah, we shouldn't do that on frequency. We should, you know, take a second, you know, not, not giving them the whole brasher and saying impossible pilot deviation. That's that's not what we want. If we need to talk about something, and that's rare that, you know, we can really address that over the phone. We may not have time and, you know, we shouldn't put ourselves in a position to publicly display being upset with somebody. I'll put it that yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah, but it is an interesting judgment call too because sometimes – if you want the world to hear what you're about to say, it, it is good, I guess, to say it on frequency. At least then I can hear it too if you're talking to somebody else. You know? So sometimes on uh, busy, busy days with a lot of, uh, and, I, and I, wanna, I don't want to put you in a different class of, of pilots, but non-airline traffic. Let's just say a, it's a Saturday where there's a lot of airplanes doing approaches at several different airports. And, and not in a mean way. I, have, I will do this occasionally. I'll key up if I have a couple of people who missed calls that I don't really have time for them to miss the call. I'm kind of figuring out my order of priorities based on where you are in relation to the final, what you're trying to do, where there's traffic. If it really doesn't take much for me to make the announcement to everybody, the next call is for you, please, everybody pay attention. I'll try to get everybody on the same frequency if we're combined up on 
geographic area so they so they know that there's another pilot speaking and you and mm-hmm. i've talked about that before um and broadcast hey everybody i need you to pay attention please the next call is for you and that usually works for for everybody that's in the airspace there won't be any more missed calls i didn't have to yell at anybody i didn't mm-hmm. have to single out one pilot it mm-hmm. could have been the same person both times but i'm, I'm letting everybody know I'm about to make 12 different calls and I need them answered the minute I give them, not a few minutes later after several attempts. So, Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and that's what we did talk about that before. I feel like that approach is so much more effective. You know, if you ask nicely for anything, I guess, in life, <laughs> you get it <laughs> or you, you're more likely to get it. So Yeah. And that, that kind of goes into one of my other points about acting like a pro, you know, sounding like a pro would be step one. And, Step two for me is for the, for the pilot side. If you're not in that airplane all the time, utilize the resources that you do have to take away some of that workload so you're not the guy missing those calls. You know, if you have somebody with you that's interested, they're obviously flying with you, they're in the front seat, ask them to run a checklist with you, hold it for you. Something simple that can mm-hmm. take your focus off of one small detail. Make sure they all know what's going on. Encourage your passengers to look outside, tell you if they see something. Um, I know there's no sterile cockpit rule for for general aviation, but set one, have your own, tell your passengers, Hey, until I tell you, and I will let you know, I need everybody to be quiet so I can listen to air traffic. And when does that happen? That's your departures, your taxiing. And when you come back, pretty much when you start your descent, you know, you're going to get a lot of instructions from air traffic. So it's probably a good time to stop the chitty chat in the airplane. Everybody's having fun, but let them know, Hey, I need to listen. I can't talk that, that will go a million miles with a controller who you never miss that call and you're complying with the instruction right away. And that is one of the big differentiating factors between a pro and someone who only flies, you know, 30, 40, 50 hours a year. Immediate response to air traffic and doing it and not wondering, wait, what do they want me to do? You know, that goes so far with us. Yeah, and that's, you know, um, that's interesting because a lot of that depends on pilot skill level. And for me as a CFI, I'm just Mm -hmm. thinking about all the times I'm in the pattern. Usually when I get, when we get not yelled at, that's the wrong word, but when we get reminded that we need to pay attention and catch calls, it's um, where it's usually a high workload. It's not chitter chatter. It's like some right. students trying to figure out they, they can't keep their flying speed on the base leg or something. So we keep going around three or four times just for that one moment to show mm-hmm. this one little thing in the airplane. And right when we get there, we get traffic calls and it's, you know, um, but I, I do understand that's not ATC's fault. That's that's a huge challenge in the CFI job. Yeah, so the more ahead of the airplane, and you say this over and over, probably to your instrument and your commercial students, if you're not one step ahead, you're you're already behind. And that goes, yeah. that's with air traffic too. What are they going to give me next? I'm, I've already been descended once. Let's see, this is where I am in relation to this airport. I'm probably going to get a downwind turn. I'm probably going to get a base turn. Anticipate those things. But in the airplane, you could really go a long way in preparing for that by making sure that you're briefing every phase of your flight. Pause. Airline pilots are not in a hurry, despite what you may think. They're pausing. They're doing checklists. They're, they're taking care of things. Yeah. Take your time. Hey, we're in cruise. Pull out the approach. Brief it to yourself, even if you're solo. You know, yeah. hey, this is how I, we're going to get vectored around. This is where we are in relation to the approach we're requesting. You know, what happens if I go missed? What happens if when I land? Which way am I turning when I get on the ground? I, th- I always think it's funny when a pilot lands and says, where do I go? But you tell me, where are you going? I don't, <laughs> I I'm not parking your airplane. But if you're one step ha- ahead of the airplane, mm-hmm. then those air traffic control instructions won't be a surprise and you won't feel like you're just reacting. You know what's coming. It's a script. Yeah. We're reading the same script every single time. Right. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. Look up in the sky, there you are. Look up in the sky, there you are. Floating like an angel on the air.